Yeah. Well, we, we could say that, and you are the... All right. Okay, stay. Yeah, not in the bees. Good morning. It's a beautiful day here. It's around 20 degrees Celsius, and I thought we'd check into this hive today. I'm going to the brood and see what's going on because we'll just pull this out and see here, not much action up here. Population might be a little low. It is winter time here, which, um, so this could be quite normal, but um, because it's a nice warm sunny day, we can go in and check out the brood. And I'm here with the lovely Bija from our customer service team, and she's gonna help out and do a brood inspection. And if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. We'll do my best to answer them. Um, always love to hear your questions. So we'll start off by going into the hive. A little bit of smoke in the entrance. Bija, do you wanna do some smoking? So over in the entrance. Yep. Great, that's probably enough. Just to let them know we're here. Hey Pete, I might just jump in on a question, just that you've got that side window off there. Because we do get quite a few customers calling in saying that their, their, their blades aren't aligned, or they're not completely closed, mm. or they look offset, or... So I thought it might be a good thing to sort of point that out in the way you look at those flow frames. Yeah, blades. that's a great idea, Trace. So if you get in close here, you'll be able to see how there's actually two types of blades there. There's the blades that are out a little bit and the blades that are inset a little bit. And how the flow frame works is the blades that are inset actually move and the blades that are out are fixed. So you can see the bees down the cells. And the reason they're inset like that is so that the, it doesn't harm the bees when they move. So it can create a bit of an optical illusion when you're looking at it sideways because it doesn't quite look like a hexagon because they're dipped in and out. So when the, when the cells are harvested, they actually do that and form a channel. Whereas now you can see they're set into a hexagon pattern. And you can see the bees have waxed the gaps up in between the cells and they've made the cells ready to fill. You see the bees are working them, but there's not many bees there. So we're gonna check that out. Let me get my hood on. It's such a beautiful day here. It's um it doesn't even seem like winter at all. Yeah, pretty lucky, and I, I'm just gonna respond with Lynette's asking um um, are we live, Lynette? And Lynette, we are live here in Northern New South Wales, Australia. <laughs> That's right, we're live. And this is, whoops, this is a view of almost Byron Bay. Byron Bay is up to the northeast there. So we'll pop the inner cover off. You can see some hive beetle up on the inner cover here. And hive beetle are a pretty big problem around this area. And so I always just squash them when I see them. The bees actually do put them in jail. They chase them around and, and guard them. So if you have a hive beetle in your area and you pop your inner cover and a whole lot of hive beetle run out, it could just be that you've broken them out of jail, which is okay. The bees will just herd them back to where they were. And um, so I'll take the super off. Thanks, Bija, if you wanna smoke it. So I guess a good way to take the super off that I that I do, at least. I try and go above the queen excluder and under, I jam my hive tool in under the metal strip here. And I try and go in along the edge of the box here. So you've got a lever point between the boxes. If you tend to go in sideways, you're just sort of gonna lever against frames underneath and you can squash bees and stuff like that. You can see I've already got some wax here on my Hive tool from doing that. So lever upwards in this lift point here. 
Hopefully you don't peel the queen excluder off, but if you do, it's okay. And feel that soup is really light. It's got hardly any honey in it. And um, BJ, do you want to pull the queen excluder off? So the plastic queen excluders are pretty flexible and if you sort of peel them up from one edge only, they can pop off at the end and spray bees everywhere. So it might be a good idea just to, just like Bija's doing, just lever around the whole thing. And I kind of like to twist them off from the corners. Yeah, just like that. And then flip it over and look for the queen underneath. If you've just joined us, we're um, just going into this hive to do a brood inspection because they just look a little bit weak in winter time. And um, Beej's a beginner beekeeper and she's here with me to do it. So if you've got any questions, please put them in the comments. We'll try and answer them. So I can't see the queen. So we can either just put that there or just knock the bees off gently. Put that aside. Pete, so, do you have a preference to the queen excluders? Because um, some people are, like to use the metal ones. Do you have a preference? I prefer the metal ones because they're less flexible. They're a little bit more solid and they're easier to clean. Because I like to just be able to clean mine with a blowtorch. You see all this ba this ah. wax build up here. Um, obviously, these portions of the queen excluder are then unusable to the bees. So I like to just kind of give it all a good torching over uh, a fire or something like that, or some container of water that the wax can drip into. And um, it's really easy to clean it that way. If you scrape this wax off, it doesn't really do anything. Oh, gotta talk to Cedar about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Bija, do you wanna jump up and pull out the first frame? Okay, I'm, I might need some instruction with this. For sure. I'm just going to give the bees a little smoke to move them out of the way. Just drives them down into the hive just a little bit. Okay. And yeah, just into that little hole there Is with your the right hook way? of your tool. Yep. You're okay. going to lever back off that frame and pop it out. Then you can get your left hand in there. If you're left handed or right handed, it can be a good idea to start on the opposite hand of your dominant hand. So you can uh, do this little shuffle here. That's great. That way, yep. Fantastic. She's going nice and slow, which is really great. When you pull bee, the bee frames out, the bees can actually roll against each other if you pull them out quickly and they don't like it. So you want to hold it up to the light. So you may have to just get the sun over your shoulder here. So maybe spin around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's all right. So the sun's up here, and so you want to get the sun over your shoulder into the cells. Oh, that way. Yeah, and you can tell what's in the, in the cells. What are you seeing? Um, it looks like there's honey. Um, there's some bee bread maybe? Yep, great. Same on this side. I'm just pointing it out to the camera here. So bee bread is the pollen that's fermenting. It's what the bees feed to their brood. You can see bees eating some honey up here. Can't see any larvae, but they are difficult to see. Yep. And what do you think about the population on that side frame? It's pretty good. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. I think it's a pretty good population already. So I think like already I can get a quite a good sense just from looking down the frames that this hive should be okay. But we're gonna keep going obviously. Do you, do you wanna put this back in or? We might put it aside for a sec. I was just gonna point out this bee with some pollen on its legs and how it's a really kind of quick and easy sign to see, okay, they're bringing plenty of pollen in. They're getting food, they're, they're foraging well. You can still see some drones in here. Um, in general, in, at this time in our area, the 
the bees are starting to kick the drones out of the hive, they'll actually um, won't let them back in and the drones then die um, because the drones seem to be very resource heavy on the hive and they don't do any foraging so they don't actually bring in any food. So there's one there. So the bees actually, the, the workers will actually kick them out at the end of a flow and usually as they go into winter. So it can be a sign if you're seeing dead drones in front of your hive and it's sort of going into winter, it can be a sign that the flowers are maybe shutting down. So if you want to just put that frame down there, maybe on its end and lean it up against the hive. If you've got any questions, please put them in the comments. Yeah, Pete, this is a good one. Um, LC is asking, if, what if the queen is accidentally harmed in this process? Will the colony replace her right away? That's a great question. Yes, they will. They, the general school of thought is that it takes around about um, from five to 24 hours for them to actually notice that they're queenless. They notice by the lack of pheromone, the queen pheromone, um, that's getting distributed throughout the hive by the queen's attendants. So that the attendants to the queen take turns and then they kind of go off and do other things in the hive and they, um, they distribute that queen's pheromone around the hive and it, it um, tells everybody that, that there's a queen. And um, when she's missing, that pheromone dissipates. And so then they realize that they're queenless and they'll start making several new queen cells from uh, a normal fertilized worker egg and they'll draw that cell out and make it bigger in order to fit the bigger sized queen, bigger than a worker. They'll feed that young, um, they'll feed that young queen larva royal jelly for its whole life until it starts pupating. And the royal jelly is the thing that um, kicks that young bee's ovaries into gear and makes her into a queen. It's a super hormone rich substance. So we can say that workers are actually just stunted queens in a way. They've they're just queens that haven't developed their ovaries. Um, it's kind of a weird little little system. So yeah, they will do that straight away. They will they will start queen cells pretty much straight away, and the beekeeper can use that to their advantage a lot of the time. If if the beekeeper wants to uh, make splits or breed breed queens or or do any of that kind of manipulation. And how long would that take? Um, how long before the queen will hatch? So she's capped on around day eight which means um, she starts pupating from a larva um, in the cell, in a capped cell, into an adult queen bee on around day eight. And then she'll emerge on day 16. And that's the shortest gestation time of the three bee cases. Uh, and I believe that's just so that they can get the queen out there and get their hive back you know, to normal as quick as possible in the quickest possible turnaround. So then after day 16 she emerges, she's got a, her exoskeleton has to harden up and, and um, she's got to get ready to fly. It takes about a week. So then she flies out to mate and mates with several drones and then flies back and starts laying eggs. And then she generally won't leave the hive again apart from when the hive swarms in the next swarm season. Right. So we can um, jump in. Bee just loosened that frame out. I have a question. Yeah. How old is this hive? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer. I don't think it's super old. I, I think it was a split that we might have made last season, actually. Um, so I think it's not too old. But having said that, you can see this wax is pretty, pretty dark. It's actually a lot heavier. So that's probably quite full of honey. You can mm. see all the honey there. Honey is the really heavy part. If you just have a brood frame, it's generally really um, light. But yeah, the wax is quite dark, so that so you can sort of tell by the colour of the wax and the hardness of the wax that it's sort of pretty old. So you maybe want to. Hold it up and see what you see. Have you ever spotted a queen, Beja? No. Not with that help. 
Yeah, what do they, you know, mirror Cedar's sister who's like the queen spotter and she says things like, don't look for the queen, look for the, for the dancing or the, the jiggle, the wiggle mm. of the bees. Yeah. I don't know, it's, I find it hard to spot too. A way that I use is I look at the whole frame and it's exactly that, the queen moves differently. So I, I generally move the bees by either touching them or blowing on them. And um, ah. I look for the difference in, in the walk. The queen's usually quicker, but she also has got fatter legs, so she sort of waddles, like you said. <laughs> and um, you can sort of pick her out usually. It's easy to mistake a drone for a queen because you're looking at that big kind of fat abdomen there. But um, a general rule of thumb with the drones, they've got really big eyes and the queen doesn't have big eyes. So if you look at its eyes, you see, oh, they're huge. So are we seeing some brood on there, Beza? Um, I can't see any myself, but I do find it hard to spot. Yeah. Are you seeing capped brood at all? Because I've just got a little bit on this side down here. It looks like yeah, it's... Yeah, there is some down the bottom. Up the top, it looks a bit more like honey yeah. stores. Yeah. And then, yes, some brood down the bottom. Seems like plenty of honey too for this hive. Yeah. We've already had a frame with lots of honey on it and another frame here with lots of honey on it. The bees will generally put honey in the brood box. They'll put it towards the outside of the brood box and they'll put the brood towards the middle. Generally speaking, they never really quite obey the rules though, but you know, um, it's just because it's easier to, fend, to defend their honey resource when it's out on the, the sides of the hive. And also having the brood in the middle gives it, um, it's more accessible for cooling and heating and temperature control. So um, do you wanna put that one back? It's looking quite good, the population's high. So it's, it's high for the brood box, but it's not high enough for, um, to work the super, I guess. If you're wearing gloves too, yeah, you can try putting it in by holding the sort of sides of those end bars like that. I find when you're wearing gloves, you get the glove caught under here when you're putting it back in and it's really hard to get them out. So you can pinch it there. So we might be getting into the brood nest now, we'll have to check that out. Any more questions, Trace? Yeah, Pete, Elizabeth's asking, she really likes the idea of a single brood box, but it's having trouble practically doing this without swarming as they have a very short, heavy flow. Mm. Any suggestions on what to do about yeah, that? Yeah, that's a really quite a tricky one. If you've got a really short, heavy flow, um, with the flow hive, you can sort of try and manage that by harvesting a lot more, but it can be really tricky to time that with the bees drying the honey out and, um, and harvesting the, the honey too early when it's not quite ready. So um, maybe it's a good idea to just think about why you want a single brood and whether it's actually going to work for you. You could, if you're going to... Um, if you're going to go down that route of getting another box anyway, you may want to consider another super um, to kind of maximise your honey. But your double brood, um, I guess the, con the cons of it are that you've just got a lot more inspecting to do. You've got more boxes to lift off, but you, the pros are that you'll have a higher population of bees ready to go when that flow really hits. And um, also in overwintering, you'll have a a better population of bees. I can see the queen on that frame, by the way. Oh. Um, and a better population of bees to go into winter and um, keep that hive going. Hi there. Yeah, nice one, you spotted her. Good eye. You can see how she moves quite differently. She's quite fast, yeah. she's racing. She's very she's speedy fast. speedy queen. They're very fast if they want to be. She's got a beautiful marking on her back of her abdomen there. Yeah, she's quite a golden brown colour. Yeah, one. and she's got the fatter legs, so you can see. I'll just move the bees out of the way a little bit. You can see she leaves a bit of a trail of, of um, no bees. They all get out of her way. But she's got the fatter legs and she sort of stalks a little bit, bumps around. So it's great to spot oh, yeah. her. Um, it's always good to lay eyes on her, even if we do see eggs, because you know, in, 
just know that she's healthy. So do we want to keep this crane in the hive? Well, we, yeah, we could do that, or we can get we can get a queen clip as well. That's another way to kind of know where she is while you're inspecting. I think she's gone to the other side, has she? Mm. Let's quickly have a little look. So, oh. it's always the way you see her, and then you lose her. There she is. Is just going through the other side again. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes with, with beekeeping it can be a real waste of time trying to catch her. But I've got my left hand here, so it's not as easy. There we go. But when you're doing an inspection, sometimes it's great to just put her in a clip really quick because then you just know that you're not going to squash her especially if you're sort of a little bit nervous about squashing her. Um, catching her in a, a clip can be a little bit nerve wracking at first. So I recommend practicing on drones because the drones can't get out of the clip either, but the workers can. These slots in the clip and this slot here, you can see the worker just got out of that that the queen can't. And that's so the workers can get in and out of the clip. See, there we go. And attend to the queen. So we can put that there. We'll probably, what we'll probably see here as we go through is that a lot of workers will flock to that clip and be all over it. So I can see lots of brood on this frame too, which is great, lots of capped brood. So from that we know, okay, the population's still gonna keep ticking over and um, it'll build and it should be okay going into spring. Hopefully I answered that double brood box question yeah, I can't remember yeah, that, that I was did. great, Pete. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all good, all good. Um, I got distracted by the queen. I know. Well, that was exciting. Um, <laughs> hey, but here's a queen question from Ama saying um, that they have a weak hive and thinking it's because of the queen. Should they requeen or let the bees do it naturally? Yeah, that's a great question. I would, um, I would think about the season. I'm just going to, as I just put that frame back in, I would think about where you are in your season. Um, how easy it will be for the bees to accept the new queen and also um, just how weak they are, how quickly you want them to build back up. You, if you're considering letting them do it, it can be a really long turnaround. As I say, like at, you know, 16, da 16 days for, them to, for the queen to emerge and then another at least a week till she's sort of flown out and mated. It generally ends up being around 25 to 28 days, so almost a month before she's back and, and laying again. Whereas if you were to buy a queen in, you know, you get it a couple of days later and you put it in your hive. The only drawback with that is that the bees may not accept the, um, the bought queen. So that is a risk. And so, you, you know, you can kill your old queen and put a bought one in and the bees then kill that queen and make their own cells anyway. So it sort of can be a bit of a gamble in a way, but it's always worth trying. But you do want to sort of make sure that you've got other options there. Maybe you need to um, just be in touch with a beekeeper who can um, provide you with more eggs perhaps or, um, or another queen if they choose to reject that, that queen. Um, you sort of just want to have a little bit of a backup plan um, so it is, it is sort of like where you are in your season and how quickly you want to get going and, and um, whether you want to keep the genetics of the current hive going or not, or if you're happy to just get new genetics into your bee yard. Um, but yeah, definitely a bought, a bought queen, a breeder queen is a lot quicker to get going again. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, great. And another sort of question on that, uh, Peter's Kate's found a very healthy swarm of bees in an old drum, um, lives in Victoria here in Australia. Should they move it into the flow hive at this time of the year? That's a really great question. Um, I would, it's, it's real, that's a really tricky one to answer because uh, it, it sort of really depends on what's, how much food there is for the bees, how much honey you're going to pull out of that 
um, I, I assume they're an established hive in the drum. How much honey are you going to pull out of that? And then how cold they'll be in their new box, how much brood you can save, all that sort of thing. Um, but if you do choose to wait until spring, then you may end up having to do a, a much larger job because the, there'll be more honey and more bees and more wax comb to take care of. So um, it, could be a, it could be a thing to do now or more towards spring as the weather sort of starts warming up a bit down there because it's a, quite a cold time to get a hive re-established, I guess. But if you're pulling out a lot of honey and a lot of brood from that colony and you can feed that back to them in, a, in an easy, safe way, then yeah, I'd say you can probably do it. Um, but it is, it, it will be more of a gamble, I guess. Um, it's sort of a gamble as opposed to more work down the track when, when all the flowers are happening. It'll be a lot easier to get them re-established in your hive. So I guess I would probably wait on it um, but you may have to do more work down the track. <laughs> yeah, gotcha, Pete. It is, it is, I guess, because it's in Victoria. Is that the main reason, because of their winters down yeah, there? Yeah, because it's so cold. We could yeah. do that right, um, right here very easily right now because it's so warm. So, Beja, do you want to pull the next frame out? You can see the bees on the queen clip as well. Yeah, that's so great to see, isn't it? The queen in there with all the bees coming up to her. They smell her and they want to be close to her. So Vija pulled that frame out a lot quicker and she was able to do that because she's got space around the frames there and she didn't touch anything with it. So it's, um, when you don't have any space, you don't want to pull the frames out quickly because the bees can roll against each other, but because there was plenty of space, you can just lift it out really easily and not worry about rolling the bees. So on here I can see lots of brood. What about on the other side? Yeah, honey up top, yeah. brood down the bottom. And that's, that's a pretty standard way that the bees will do it. So we've got a middle frame here. If you think of the hive as a ball, or a kind of a half ball and you get the brood in this half ball pattern and then you get the food up the top in the kind of rainbow spread up above the brood. And there's usually a little interface of pollen in between the brood and the honey. These little cells, I'm not sure, I can't see, but I think there's pollen in them. Uh, yeah, there is. So there's usually that, just a little kind of bee bread or pollen interface between the honey and the brood. I can see all this brood capping. On your bee inspections, you just want to make sure that that's all kind of healthy. You can see that it pretty much looks healthy. All these blank cells are probably where bees have emerged previously and they haven't been laid in yet. I can't, I don't know, I can't see eggs because of my position, but the queen may have laid them up. Um, so we just want to see that all the cappings are kind of uniform and not perforated or chewed out in any way. It all looks nice and healthy. Does it look look good on the other side, Bija? Yeah, it's the same, I think, on this side. Awesome. Um, so I have a question. With this hive, what do you suggest we do with it over our winter? Yeah, great question. Nothing. <laughs> um, and that is actually a really valid thing to do in beekeeping, you just do nothing. Um, I think a lot of people get into a, a um, state of mind where they have to do something, but I can see these bees have plenty of stores, their population looks fine. They didn't have enough bees up in the super for me to, you know, that I would think, oh, these, this hive is really strong. But as soon as we get down into the brood box, I can see there, they look totally fine. They've got plenty of stores. They'll get through the cold weather fine. So should we remove the super? Um, we could, but also around here, we don't have to. But yeah, if you were in a cold climate, I probably would recommend it. Um, but, but around here we can just sort of get away with it all year long just to have a super on. So yeah, it's one of those calls again where you've really got to sort of call it by your climate and what's going on in your local area in terms of forage for the bees. So I want to put that one back and we'll keep going through. Nice one. Hey Pete, Todd's asking if you've um, up on any updates on the Varroa mite in this area. Or, or just generally, I think, in Australia, he's actually asking. Um, 
No, not as far as I know. I've, um, the containment, I believe, is still happening. Um, there's restrictions on moving hives and there's, so the varroa have only been found in a state called New South Wales, which is where we live, but it's far south of us. There's little pockets um, that have been found due to movement of hives and the um, controlling government body has made zones around those pockets where varroa has been found. Um, everybody in the state is um, everyone in the state needs to alcohol wash their hives every 16 weeks to um, keep that detection up and um, I think that's as far as it's got really so we're just in the wait and see pattern I think the the government body is doing everything they can to make sure that it's controlled I believe they're trying to eradicate it completely and I really hope they can <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, well, Walter, you've asked a question, but I'm a little bit confused. So, Walter, can you just repost your question about the capping? That would be great. Sorry, Beja? Oh, I just noticed the change in tone, the, the buzzing. Yeah. A little, bit, a little bit agitated, I think. Maybe, yeah, that's right. And we've probably had the hive open for quite a while now. Um, that's not to say you can't take your time, but Beja's really onto it. She's totally noticed the change. And that's a real, your ears are a really great tool when you're working bees. Um, so if they do start getting a little bit more buzzy, it can mean they might be getting agitated. What can happen is that when you open a hive and leave it open, the bees will um, start fanning a pheromone. You can see this bee's doing that there. It's got its bum up in the air, fanning a pheromone called Nazanov. And that's telling all the foragers, hey, something's going on. When you come back, stay here. It's saying, hey, we're all here, come back and stay. And so what happens is the foragers come back, they see the hives looking quite different. They can smell the, the pheromone and they'll stay at home. And the foragers are actually the ones that um, want to defend the hive. So the more foragers that are at home, the more chance and the more bees there are to defend the hive. So that can be what happens when when the hive's open for a long time. But the bees are still being nice. I took my suit off because I thought they were nice. Hopefully they stay nice. <laughs> <laughs> I get so hot in my suit. Um, what are we seeing on that frame? Lots of honey at this side. Yeah. It's yeah it's quite heavy with honey. Um, See some drone cells here. See yeah, them popped out. Drone cells caps. on this side as well. So it's interesting to note the different cell sizes here. I think I've said this in a couple of lives before, but it's always good to check it out. You can see these honey cells. These are dedicated honey cells. You can see they're like a teardrop shape almost, and they've got a little angle to them so that the honey doesn't fall out. So these cells are only for honey. The bees will only put honey on them. In them, you can see the nectar that hasn't been dried out yet. And you see up here, this has all been dried properly and it's been capped off, just like putting a lid on a jar. And then next door, we've got the brood cells here, which are for worker brood. So they're quite, like, quite a lot smaller and they're very hexagonal in shape and their capping is like very distinct and defined. You can see the distinct um, cells in the capping. And then over towards here, you can see a bigger cell again, which is drones drone cells so they're hexagonal they're not teardrop and you can see the popped out uh, cappings here that are designed for the bigger bodies of the drones as they pupate now the bees will only fill um, the bees will only use these honey cells for honey but these worker sized cells they'll put honey in those these drone sized cells they'll put, put honey in those so it's interesting to kind of note that that when they're running out of room, they'll put honey anywhere. The bees will just drop it off. Um, generally, the pollen will only go into the worker size cells. So you can sort of tell a lot from the cells on the frame as to what the bees might be trying to do. And you're always sort of guessing, but it can give you a clue. 
Is that similar on the other side? Is there, yeah. there a few drone sized cells? Yes, down the bottom There's corner. Quite a lot more, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. There's a big patch of them in here. And I guess too, we can sort of guess that there's still quite a bit of food if the queen's still laying drone cells, sorry, and still laying drone eggs and they're um, still making drones. Because as I said earlier, drones are quite resource heavy in the hive and they don't do any foraging. So the bees will actually kick them out at the end of a flow season because they'll eat all the food and they're not necessarily kind of doing their job at the, at the time, which is to mate with queens. So queens aren't really generally flying in the winter time. Pete, that might help. You might have sort of answered it, kind of, but the unboiled frog. <laughs> That's <laughs> a great Question from the unboiled frog. I didn't know you boiled frogs, but anyway. In Toowoomba, Beck, um, has, a, has had the flow hive for about six months and have not seen any drones or drone cells. What does this mean? That can mean that the hive's just getting established as well. If you've only had it for a short period of time, it might not have enough resources to start kind of making drones. Um, also, it depends on your the comb situation. As, if you've got uh, a brand new hive and they haven't drawn all their comb, they'll the time they're drawing comb, they'll draw the comb that they need. So if they're drawing comb in you know springtime when everything's popping and going nuts and they need lots and lots of drones to get their genetics out there, they'll build heaps and heaps of drone comb. Whereas if they're just building comb steadily and trying to build up through a non sort of flow season then um, they won't build as much drone comb or or even no drone comb so what you may see i don't know if you've got undrawn frames or not but what you may see is um, coming towards spring as we get sort of into august i guess you'd get an early spring up there i'm not sure um, august september you probably see the, a lot more drones in your hive hopefully <laughs> What are you seeing on that other side, Bija? Um, just normal honey up top. Not so much capped cells. A few. And so maybe I wonder if we can see eggs. We haven't seen any yet. We've seen the queen, so that's okay. We know she's fine. But it's if we didn't see her, it'd be good to see some eggs because then we'd know she's been there in the last three or four days because the eggs take three days to hatch out into tiny little lava. If you want to try and see the eggs, you may need to get the sun down in the cells over your shoulder. Oh yeah, I can. Awesome. Yes, I can see some larvae in the can bottom. See, see larvae? Yeah, I'll show you the camera in there. Okay. Can you see it? So we're looking at lava? Yeah, it's the white kind of little white grubs. Grubs. See that in there? Yep. Little white C-shaped grubs. Hopefully the camera's picking it up. And um, so they're actually older larvae. So they're about they're almost being capped. You can tell they're quite fat. They're in a real. They're sort of jammed up in the cell. Um, and they're probably going to be capped off in a few days for them to pupate. They're probably about five or six days old. Maybe a little more. I'll just rest it on here. And so that tells us that the queen's definitely been there within that time, within that amount of time. So if we want a shorter time frame, we, we can see some eggs, hopefully. It's just a bit difficult on the angle. I think I can see some very young larva in here. Sometimes it's easier to look for a wet patch down the bottom of the cell. Never really want to tell anyone to look for a wet patch, but you know, just some um, beekeeping. Is there any more questions? <laughs> yeah, hey, Lynette's asking, um, do bees slow down like when you put a fly, like flies do in the fridge in cold weather? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Yeah, they do. They really do. In really cold weather, they'll, um, they really slow down their metabolism. They, the bees that, in, you know, in snowy climates, the bees that are bred to go through winter ha are um, much larger. They have a lot more fat on their fat bodies and they'll actually live for the duration of the winter. They, they don't forage, they just cluster up inside the hive. Thank you. They just cluster up inside the hive and they just wait out the winter and they slowly consume their honey. 
So yeah, they do really slow down. They keep warm. I don't know, maybe this is a funny analogy, but if you've seen the penguin movie where the penguins are all doing the, the um, slow walk around through the winter, they, they um, you know, each penguin on the outside gets a turn in the middle. The cluster is sort of a bit like that. They sort of do that and they, they, some bees get cold and they come in and warm up and sort of that keeps cycling around like that. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, great. Pete, have you ever or can you accidentally qu kill a queen um, by putting her in that queen clip? Yeah, it's definitely possible, but again, Sorry, BJ, let's jump in there. You can see all the worker bees on it. But again, so the way you can do it is jam her in that little sort of sliding part here that goes over the top of each other in the side. And um, you, can't, you can't really trap her in here. You've got to be careful. But um, it's pretty rare. But like I say, if you're quite nervous about it, just practice on drones first. And I recommend just practicing picking up bees if you if you want to as well just by their wings um, and if you're nervous about that practice on drones because the drones don't sting do they Pete? that's right that's it so and that's a great way to practice so you can see it just picked it up by its wings you've got to be quite light but um it can actually be really handy to be able to do that because sometimes a queen can go really kind of um, errant and just she can fly away or she can it's kind of rare but if she's jumpy she will and so if you need to pick her up it's a really good just to be able to be confident to do it so just a good little thing to get you into beekeeping a bit more um, you can clearly see the like wet uh, patch <laughs> in <laughs> yeah. that corner <laughs> there yeah. as opposed to there so what is that though Oh uh, yeah, wait, that's honey. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's right. So it's all it's all um, wet nectar that hasn't been dried out yet. So if we see a lot of that, we know, oh, the bees are actually bringing that in right now as opposed to it being stores from before. So that's a really good thing to see for our information because we know, oh, they're actually getting food now and the flowers haven't shut down, so they're working something, which is great. It means that they're still bringing food in and so if you see that open nectar in your hive, that's what you can kind of um, make an assumption about. Same thing if you see pollen on bees' legs. So there's still a little bit of capped brood in here. That's really good. Pete, can you have more than one queen in a hive? Yeah, that is a funny question too. That's a really good question. You can, but no, you sort of can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, in general, no, there's just one queen, but bees don't really follow the rules sometimes and in the process of maybe the, um, the old queen slowing down and they make new queen to, to um, get new kind of vigour into their hive, they have been known just to let, let the old queen just kind of, you know, hang around and not, not kill her. Um, you know, she's just in the granny flat downstairs. <laughs> but uh, generally they'll ball her up and sting her and that'll be that for her if she starts failing. That's one way. Beekeepers um, do spot a lot of virgin queens at a time in swarm balls. So you've, when a swarm leaves the hive, it generally leaves with the, the old queen, the established laying queen but a whole bunch of virgin queens can emerge at the same time and just leave with the swarm. So beekeepers find many queens in a swarm. That's another scenario. There's sort of a lot of scenarios where it's possible, but generally, no. Generally, they don't have two you know, viable laying queens in their hive. It's just the one, and she's just laying all the eggs at a time. And see here, like on this frame, that's a good example of cell sizes. So we've got Right in the middle here, it's, I can see a patch of drone, drone cells. You can sort of see how the bees wax the, the cells up quite thickly on the walls. That can mean that there's been a bunch of brood go through there too. 
And then you've got the honey cells are sort of kicked up at an angle just there. And then a big chunk of worker cells here. It's quite easy to see the sizes side by side without anything in them. So this side frame looks like it doesn't have anything in it. And so this is what we were looking at, thinking there wasn't much going on. Yeah. Um, it's pretty normal too. You can see by the rest of the hive that it's actually fine. And what about the other side? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. a big chunk of honey and some, a big chunk of nectar come in. So it's great. This hive is, is fine and it's always worth having a look um, as long as it's hey, just, a nice Just before you pop that frame back, Vija, just a question on, see how on that frame you're holding in that corner, they've, they've built all the way to the bottom of the frame there, whereas the others all have that gap. See, they mm. don't build all the way to the bottom. Is, is that just it's, whatever? I believe it's just so they've got a walkway. Ah, uh, so that, but yet they've built it, that end of it, which is the only one that they haven't, is they like all the way to the bottom? Yeah, it's quite strange, isn't it, where yeah. they choose to to fix it or not? Um, so it's just a random kind of a thing. It seems quite random. I'm sure they've got a reason for it, but but the way they build their wax seems very random. Just slide that over. And can you spot royal jelly? in there or where is the royal jelly? Yeah that's a good question so that was the, sh the shiny wet patch at the bottom of the brood cell that I was saying it's good to look look out for the the shiny wet patch um, when you're looking at brood so the royal jelly is actually in a pool around the newly hatched larvae so um, an egg in the bottom of a cell will just be dry a single egg nothing else but once that egg hatches into a little grub and the bees start feeding it royal jelly for the first couple of days and it actually sits in a pool of it and spins around and eats it and the bees keep filling it up, keep giving it royal jelly into its cell and then they'll switch it to bee bread after that, after the first few days. Cool. So do we move all these up and put that one here yep. or do we put this one at the end? No, yeah, we'll move them back. So we'll pop the queen over here, get her out of the smoke and I'll smoke these guys out of the way. A quick trick to get them off the side, if you want to, is to get the edge of your hive tool and put it dead up against the hive so that there's no gaps and then just scrape along. If you do it nice and slow, these will just move out of the way. And All these need to go up. Yep, and so we can put this, the hive tool down and use it as a lever. And we'll just do it, we'll just do it all at once so that oh, we're not okay not squashing bees in between. Yeah. Do you want to do that? So. Well, that's a handy little trick, Pete, isn't it? Like pushing them all at once, whereas it's easy just to do one at a time sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, so maybe get this end here, put it down along the wall, and then push that way towards that end of the hive or that side of the hive. Yep. Cool, and then go to the other side or the other end, I should say. Just move those out of the way. Yep. Yeah, so the benefit of doing this is that you don't get bees caught in between these end bars. One more, I reckon, down this end. And these boxes are slightly oversized, so you do have a little bit of wiggle room up this other end. And so you can afford just to sort of leave them a little bit. I'll just give it a little, little extra little hoik over there, just to give you plenty of room. And we haven't, we've left a little bit of a bee gap just in here, which is nice, I don't have to squash them. Now most of these bees have gone back in the hive already. Which is great. That makes it easy. You can see B just slid those end bars together while she put it in, which is great. It means she's not going to squash any bees too. Makes it really easy. Cool. And that so you want this gap and this gap to be, you know, sort of fairly level. And then that's good enough. And then we can release the queen. If you can't see the queen. Well, 
You don't want to you don't want to shake these bees off because they will rattle the queen around inside. So what you can do is blow them off, but you want to probably make sure you've got your hood on because they can come and sting you in the face. Saying that. <laughs> So now you can see the queen to release her. And she should run straight down between the top bars of the frame. Yeah. Nice work. Is there any more questions, Trace? Oh, that was, that was so great to see the queen clip. Uh, the people, and they often ask us, this, why don't we mark our queens? Um, I don't know. We, we just kind of don't <laughs> like really make bother. It tricky. Well, it's it's always nice to mark them to be able to see them. Um, it makes it a lot quicker. Generally, in my beekeeping, my own apiary, I, if I see my queen, I'll mark her because it just it makes everything so much quicker if I need to find her next time. Um, generally, generally around here, we're not doing heaps of manipulations or trying to find queens a lot, and so it's just sort of. Um, we just leave them be. Um, we're not opposed to marking them at all. Um, but obviously mark, beekeepers mark queens to show how old the queen is. So every year there's an international colour code for queens. So we won't put that on yet. Okay. We'll put the super on. Oh, that's, <laughs> there's, um, oh, that, that's great, Pete, because that was, someone was asking that, like, is there some, isn't there some colour coding or something? Yeah, and that's easy to find. You just, just um, search it on the internet. And so beekeepers will mark, have a have a colour for their particular year. I don't even know what um, colour it is this year, because I don't generally bother to follow it myself. But but it's definitely a, a thing that's useful for a lot of beekeepers. How are they looking over there? Yeah. Great. Pete, would you expect for this super to get any honey in it over winter or? Not really around yeah. here at the moment. We've just come out of a flow of Melaleuca um, paper bark and that's been a really strong flow but it, it tends to just shut down really quickly. It pulses after the rain. It's been really, really great but, um, but now it seems to have all shut down. Um, there's plenty of stores in the brood box. We could actually pull this super off but we can get away without it just in our own climate and area because Usually through winter, there's sort of stuff for the bees to just kind of cycle by on. We saw plenty of open nectar in the bottom of the brew box there so that we know they're actually bringing stuff in. Don't know what it really is, but um, don't know what they're working. There's no strong flow on, but um, I expect they'll just get through winter fine. And, you know, there was just enough brew to keep the cycle, to keep the hive going, not really to kind of grow it, but I'd expect in springtime, which are around here is generally hits around mid-August to September, um, everything starts really blooming and the bees start really um, building up. So, yeah, as I said, this hive looks really healthy and fine. I was wondering about it because I looked in the window and didn't see many bees up here. I thought they might be quite weak, so it might be a good thing to look into seeing how they were. But once we got into the brood box, it's easy to see they were fine. So we don't have to do anything, which is really great. Um, is there any other questions, Trace? No, look, you've answered it and people giving you lots of good feedback, Pete. Loving today's session, lots so informative and love it too with you, Bees. It's always great having a beginner yeah. beekeeper um, on there as well, you guys. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks oh, a and, lot, Bees. Oh, actually, did I did have a question, oh, Bees, cool. about Bees' bee suit. Because this is a question we get asked all the time, is what size bee suit should I get? So, yeah. Bees, what size suit are you wearing? This is an adult's S. Okay. So small. S gloves. Yep. And I'm 167 centimetres tall and I weigh 60 kilos. There you go. There you go. Put it out there <laughs> on the internet. And if you jump on the bee suit uh, website, you'll see this great video of bees are doing magic stuff in bee suits. So check it out. Jumping. <laughs> yeah, jumping. Yeah. With and Callum's expert film editing. And this is a medium jacket. Too, yeah, great. Just for the record, and it fits me really well. And I don't know how much, uh, how high I am, or how much I weigh. It. I think I'm about 80 kilos, but I'm about that much taller than Bija. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, guys. Cool. And thanks heaps for tuning in. Um, it's really great to have you, and hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>